Well, Duck, the viability rankings looked good. You may shake my hand if you like. Well, under the circumstances, I'd rather not. E? Uh, ADV, you are the most broken tier in Smogon 6s. You have everything. You mean I have arena trap? Yes. Choice band explosion? Yes. Sandville cheese? Uh, a little bit, yes. You also have several archetypes that have just been discovered in you. I see. You sure you just haven't made thousands of mistakes? Uh, no. No, I'm afraid not. Well, this sounds like bad news. Well, you'd think so, but all of your threats are in perfect balance. Uh, if you have a moment, I can explain. Well... Here's the door to the ban list, you see? And these are oversized novelty mons. Uh, that's Heracross, that's Jirachi, and this cute little cuddlebug is Dragon Dance Titar. <laughs> Here's what happens when they all try to get through the door at once. Move it, shout ahead. We call it Three Stooges Syndrome. So it, what you're saying is... I'm perfectly balanced. Oh, no, no. In fact, even a slight shift could... Perfectly balanced. Got my, uh, my SPL true on. I do? Oh. Uh, hey, everybody. Welcome back to Fireside Casts. And more importantly, welcome to uh, week three of SPL, ADVOU. I'm your host, the Bulldozer. And bear in mind, while I keep my cat out of my way, I'm excited for this week because, importantly, uh, now that the first two weeks are over, players can be allowed to play in tiers that they didn't sign up for. So we're going to have some people moved around. On occasion, you may see... Uh, you know, if somebody hasn't been doing too well, there may be a different player swapped in, which we are going to see today. Uh, importantly, we have, if we can get our player list pulled up on the screen, we're going to have, let me check exactly who it was, Techlist was swapped out for HCLAT, and Tomahome was swapped out for, no, Tomahome was in, Z Zomog was swapped out for Umbri, I think? Hold on, I just have the actual players. I have the, the games in front of me. Played on the Chronicles last week. Hold on. I thought that I, I. Okay, yeah, Umbria was Chronicles. I thought I had everything prepared, but apparently I can't remember seven days back. Uh, I've got my cool SPL 2019 shirt on, which was when the Ruiners took it. And I think that's when the meme about Blender swapping in his Swamper into a Rotom Wash came up. Great year. Had a lot of fun watching that. And, uh, you know, having a, even more fun watching this week or this season. So let's get right into it with our first game, which is going to be Gilbert Arenas, also known as Markop, versus McMegan. So we're going to have Markop here on the left under the name Raditz4206, and McMegan on the right. Let's get right into it. So looking at the lead matchup, we're going to have... Metagross from McMegan met with a Zapdos from Markop. And I want to play this first turn because Zapdos immediately goes for substitute, whereas McMegan makes the safe play out to Blissey. Um, your Metagross has options versus Zapdos. It's going to live a hit. It's going to be able to strike back if it wants. But unless you're ready to pull the trigger and explode on turn one, it's really not a super... Um, it's not a great play, especially since stuff like this could happen. You're not going to be outspeeding a base 100 feet Zapdos with your Metagross. So Zapdos gets up a sub, and sub immediately says possibility of Baton Pass. Um, could have any number of things in the back. You could have Trappers, you could have Celebi, you could have uh, anything that wants a substitute, really. You know, Baton Pass Zapdos is not exactly a, uh, a, a phoned-in set. There's multiple options in front of it. So, with that in mind, we're going to move forward into this next turn, and Zapdos is going to Baton Pass out into Doug Trio. And with the existence of these nicknames on both of these two first two mons, going to suggest, you know, Markov making a very confident play. He would have the beat up on the Doug Trio. Beat up is going to be able to two hit KO the Blissey, which an Earthquake normally would not be able to do. So Ice Beam from Blissey is going to pop the sub. And there is the beat up, and it's going to be doing a lot of damage. I don't think that crit really mattered in the long run, but, you know, you can see this Blissey is getting absolutely shredded on turn three, and... Doug Trio should live the Ice Beam, yeah. Importantly, next turn, it will take out the Blissey, but if it wants to come back in, uh, there can't be spikes down. One single layer of spikes is going to kill this Doug Trio, and that could really limit Markop in future plays. Um, specifically, you know, if, if there is a Skarmory paired with this Blissey or anything like that, you really can't afford to let it get down those spikes unless you want to 
just sack your Dug Trio on the next turn. You know, you it really it takes a Pokemon from a fast revenge killer into just a sack. So Mark, I'm gonna need to keep that in mind in the future. But considering we have seen a Zapdos, he certainly is, you know, he has choices on how to try and keep spikes off. So with that in mind, we're gonna go into this next turn. I would imagine the beat up is gonna do its job and take out this Blissey. And McMegan now gets to just go straight back into the Metagross. Metagross not going to mind the beat up nearly as much. Has a pretty fat base defense stat. However, it is going to miss a Meteor Mash, and I have to imagine that McMegan will mind that. Next turn it comes in. McMegan going to take the initiative and swap out to Suicune. Not really a great Zapdos switch in. However, McMegan probably didn't know that the Zapdos was coming. Meanwhile, Markov seeming to know what's coming. He makes a great prediction. You know, I say prediction, that could very well be Hidden Power Grass, and he just wanted to make the safe play that would both damage the Suicune and also catch any ground-type or electric resist that wanted to come in for free on the Zapdos. Going to be rewarded for that with a critical hit that's going to take Claydol immediately down to 4%, uh, and that's going to be unfavorable for McMegan. You know, that is his spinner, that is his rock resist. If there's a T-Tar in the back for Markov, it's certainly going to make things more difficult. So McMegan is going to immediately reveal Jirachi, and we now have five revealed from McMegan, only three revealed from Markov. And Markov is going to take this opportunity to get up another sub on McMegan's Calm Mind, and that could make things just a little bit clunky here. If this is Calm Mind, if this is some sort of Super Celebi, then, you know, you could expect it to have Ice Punch, you could expect it to have Thunder. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think it'll outspeed the Zapdos, so Markov will be able to Baton Pass out if he wants to. However, um, He's certainly got the coverage to do whatever he wants with this with this next turn. So Markov is going to get out the baton pass. Going to reveal a Tyranitar, as mentioned. And an Ice Punch is going to immediately pop the sub. However, this teacher kind of has, you know, free reign at the moment to, to throw out an attack if it wants to. It's going to eat a Thunder and get full Parrot from Markov. However, the Lumberry is going to immediately cure that one. That's why you run it. And a 54% roll is going to be a little clunky next turn. 52, 54, that's a hard one to rely on. However, <sighs> Thunder is going to bring down t to 1% and Terra. And then a critical hit from Markov is going to take out the Jirachi. And Markov is one lucky guy. So this t is at this point dead in the water. Another Pokemon that doesn't want Spikes to go up. However... Markov decides he just wants to sack it. Megan gets the T-Tar out of the way. Claydol going to be slowly getting its health back. However, every time the Zapdos comes in, um, Megan really has to decide how it wants to, how he wants to, you know, give up some life. So Markov giving up life instead, taking another 25% to get a substitute set up. These substitutes are going to start mattering a little bit more now that Sand is up from Markov's own T-Tar. However, McMegan is going to be able to keep the subs down with the use of his Metagross. Zapdos, however, doing good damage, running the risk of a, thunder, of a paralysis, and it's just overall not a favorable position for McMegan. He's taking a lot of damage. Uh, his, his Pokemon that are meant to mitigate... What's going on on screen? His Pokemon that are meant to mitigate the damage that Markov is doing aren't really being kept alive. However, where there is a Suicune, there's a way. So we're going to see if McMegan can pull something off with his Suicune here. So McMegan's going to start calm mining up, and we're going to see the Rock Resist Celebi. Not really a Rock Resist, not really a T-Tar switch in at all. However, you know, you can play those mind games with Beat Up Dunk Trio if you so please. The move will reveal all of the names of your Pokemon, be they nicknames or regular names. And finally, the last is going to get revealed for McMegan, which is a uh, Salamence. I don't think that this... Uh, it's it could very well be a Dragon Dance Salamence, but it's a little hard to tell at this point in the game. It's probably not hard to tell. I'm just not good at reading teams. It's going to reveal Hidden Power of Flying. Not going to do too much damage to the Metagross. And importantly, it does not take leftovers after Sand, so it is going to be some sort of uh, you know very offensive set. And you're just going to see Markov slowly wearing down McMegan's team. McMegan is going to trade his Metagross for Suicune from Markov, and that's certainly going to open up possibilities for McMegan Suicune. However, the Zapdos is still going to make things a little awkward going forward.
Mark up gonna the taunt pass back out into the Metagross. Not gonna mind anything that McMegan clicks too much, and is especially not gonna mind that missed rock slide. Not gonna do any damage to the Metagross. And oh, that's gonna be a sweet coon going down to sand. You have uh, what 20% left on the clay doll, so it's really just up to the Salamis to try and get it done. Claydol can really put some damage in on Metagross if it so chooses. And trying to avoid that, Markov is going to just sack the Dug Trio, going to be able to get the Zapdos in again freely and click its hidden power. And that is going to be revealed to be hidden power grass. And at this point... You know, you don't want to take the rock slide, however, you really have an opportunity to try and fish for a miss if you so please. And McMegan tries to make a play there, tries to predict the Metagross to come in to absorb the rock slide. And with that correct play made, McMegan is just going to say, good game, that's that, and uh, give up the goat. Is that the phrase? So, you know, that was... I'm not going to pretend like Markov didn't get pretty lucky there. But overall, he made good plays on his part. It's not like he was getting bailed out. It was just his uh, his building advantage just kind of leapt forward a bit. So, you know, I'm not uh, I'm not going to make a big deal about it or anything. It's not like I have any sort of um, any sort of position to make a big deal out of it. it just, you know, it's not like it was a lost cause for him or anything in the first place. So, with that in mind, we're going to go into the second game here, which is going to be Star Master versus Teclas. Teclas swapping in for h -plat. And let's get right into it. Set the speed to slow. Look at the lead matchup. For lead, we have Salamence from Star and the Salamence from Teclas. Is there some... Meme with Dratak? Is that the name of it in another language or something? Hold on, hold on. Okay. I, I just wanted to finish that thought because that was what uh, that was what Megan's Salamence was as well. So if anybody has that information for me, please let me know. I'm interested to, to be in on the epic pro player memes. Uh, so going into this second game, we're gonna see. First of all, I wanna I wanna iterate that both players leading Salamence. On turn one, without really knowing anything about these players' teams, neither of them really wants to stay in because there's there's no set that a lead Salamence could have that's really good. Because Choice Band Rock Slide would bonk either of them. Mix wouldn't care about Intimidate, and it would bonk either of them with Dragon Claw. And even like uh, if you're running Flamethrower Wish Salamence or something, you wouldn't want to take a Toxic. So neither of them want to stay in. And we're going to see how they make their perspective plays from that. So, Teclas going to reveal a Fortress, probably not fearing a fire attack against the Salamence too much. And Starmaster is going to reveal Blissey. Blissey immediately going to throw out a Thunder Wave, which is going to slow down that Fortress. Overall, not a huge threat to the Fortress. However, Starmaster is going to reveal his own Fortress, and this game could go on. Fortress mirrors are never, uh, they're always a little spooky. However, important to note with this Tyranitar being revealed, the presence of a fortress almost always means the presence of pursuit. So it would not, you know, you can kind of expect for this t to be mixed or to be straight special. And, you know, we haven't seen anything that really fears a pursuit too much. However, if you do have a fortress, if you do have spikes, and you do want to try and block a rapid spinner, and you maybe have a Gengar in the back, then that would absolutely be something you want to watch out for. So. Going into this next turn, Teclas is going to have the lead in speed. and He's going to start charging up a Focus Punch here. And Starmaster responds with a Salamence. With both the Intimidate and the Fighting Resist, he's not going to take too much from the Focus Punch. And he is going to be able to throw out an attack if he so pleases. Probably going to be able to chunk the Tyranitar pretty hard. Starmaster reveals that his Salamence is special. And Teclas reveals that his Tyranitar is special too. Focus Punch, 150 base power. Not going to really mind your investment too much. And he's going to drop that Salamence almost immediately. Lead goes 5-6 in favor of Teclas. However, Starmaster is now going to reveal his own Tyranitar, taking immediate 16% from the Spikes. And 
not have an attack loss from the Intimidate. Techless making the swap to... Excuse me, Texas make, Techless making the swap to Swampert named Lagron. Uh, immediately going to reveal that Starmaster's Tyranitar is also special with the crunch. Not going to mind it too much. Swampert's pretty bulky, usually has pretty good special defense investment. However, it's really not going to be able to hurt this fortress either. And that's going to give Starmaster an opportunity to possibly get a layer down, if not two. He is going to be able to live another Surf, and Starmaster is going to elect to get the Spikes off instead. And now he is going to have the opportunity to get up one layer. However, Teclis wants to take this opportunity to get his own back up as well. So Starmaster taking the initiative, making a swap out to uh, Jirachi. I have to imagine that this has Fire Punch to be swapping to it so freely. He is going to reveal that. You can't imagine that it's probably some sort of Astarachi that's death investment. And Teclis is going to reveal Moltres in response to it. That could, going to go back to the fortress, trying to make the double out in response to Starmaster swapping. And that is going to work out in his favor. Starmaster, fearing the Moltres, is going to go to Blissey. And now Fortress is going to have an opportunity to try and get at least one layer up. Jirachi comes back in, and Teclis is going to get his layer. However, this fortress is still going to be forced out. Swamp are going to come in pretty freely. Not going to mind anything that that Jirachi does too much, unless it uses Toxic. Toxic is going to put an immediate clock on this Swamper, and is not going to make it nearly as uh, reliable of a switch in as you would expect to the Swamper. However, uh, Teclis is actually going to reveal refresh and reveal that this is a mono perk. And frankly, that seems to be something that uh, Starmaster would maybe struggle with a little bit. You're going to see that protect getting the leftovers back every turn, and status isn't really going to work against it. So, uh, Teclis just trying to make some clever plays to uh, keep the momentum on his side, and for that, he's going to get a rapid spin. Did he forget that spikes were already removed? Am I missing something here? Or is he just sacking his fortress? Jirachi going to throw out a wish. Not a huge target to send it to at the moment. However, it doesn't really matter. Not that this swapper can really hurt the pussy. So both of these teams have very strong defensive cores, as you will see from Fortress and... You know, they're both just trying to get the upper hand. Teclos reveals his last to be Blissey. We could have this start going on for a bit. Fortress now comes back in on Blissey, on Starmaster Blissey, who's going to throw out a Thunder Wave and whiff on the already paralyzed Fortress. Fortress slowly getting that HP back from the leftovers. And every time Jirachi's going to be able to come back in, However, Teclis seems to be on top of the... This is this could go on for a while. One of them is going to need to try and make a play eventually. However, you just want to try and wear down some PP if you can help it. Teclis eats a seismic toss. Going to be able to heal that up without too much of a fanfare. Paralysis could make things a little tricky. However, Teclis reveals that he has Wish on his Blissey. And it's all going to kind of come down to whatever the last from Starmaster is, because, you know, his team is very slow. And if that's kind of the point of his team, then so be it. But if he has something fast that hits hard, he can really start making some opportunities for himself, as it were. However, Fortress gets in from Starmaster, possibly going to be able to set up a spike. And we saw last week... Uh, just how quickly those spikes can start speeding the game up for you when things are going really slow like this. However, Teclis finally goes back to his Salamence, and that is certainly going to be something that could speed up the game. Starmaster reveals an Aerodactyl, and immediately rock slides are going to start being thrown out. I take it back. Double edges are going to be thrown out, and... Swampert is immediately going to get bombed for a critical hit, 85% damage. Starmaster, again, tries to keep the initiative and is going to swap out to his own T-Tar on Teclis's swap out to his T-Tar. And now Starmaster does have the opportunity to just throw out crunches. And he can honestly keep throwing out crunches. This Moltres could very well have, you know, hidden power grass. Um, 
it's not going to mind the Wisp too much considering it's a special set. And with that, we're going to have Sand taking down the Moltres. The game is now going to be tied at 5-5. Five, five. Starmaster with a full health Tyranitar on the field. Lissy's going to come in. We don't really know too much about that Tyranitar set. And it seems like he doesn't have any sort of physical attack to try and shore up for the Blissey weakness. So he's going to be forced back out. And at this point, it's just looking for an opportunity to get Aerodactyl back in. Blissey going to chunk Fortress for 62. However, he's going to take that without too much of an issue. And importantly, he's going to have an opportunity to get up a spike here. So he tries to keep the initiative. He wants, he seems to want Star Master's Fortress down a lot more than he wants his own down. Or rather than he wants his spikes down. Because he certainly had opportunities. And a smart play from Teclis is going to get a brick break off onto the Blissey, going to be threatening it for the next turn. However, that's not really doing enough damage. That is kind of the uh, the sacrifice that you make, the leftover Salamence. You know, you're not going to be able to do enough to a Blissey. You're not going to be able to break that 50 damage threshold. And Blissey's going to get healed back up. So does Star Master bring Fortress back in on Teclis's Fortress, and do they both start getting up spikes? Starmaster does, and Teclis goes straight back to his Salamence. Lissy's at 100%, so he can keep taking these Brick Breaks. However, Starmaster decides to go to Aerodactyl instead. Not going to mind the Brick Break too much. However, it's not going to be able to take another attack from the Salamence. That being said, Swapper doesn't want to come in. Nothing really wants to take these hits very hard. You're going to see a Rock Slide come out. 40% damage on a T-Tar. Uh, it's a little bit clunky. I don't know the roll exactly. But a miss is going to mean that it doesn't really matter. Titar going to be well out of range. However, Pursuit, not going to be able to take out the Aerodactyl this turn. So he does get another opportunity to find the kill on the Tyranitar. And a flinch is going to be huge there. It's going to really open up a uh, chance for Starmaster to turn this around. His Tyranitar is now going to go down. The game is going to be 5-4 in favor of Starmaster. That being said, Jirachi is still his best way of taking out Teclis' Fortress. And Teclis is still playing this game, bringing the Salamence every time. Because Starmaster really needs the spikes down. Because Swampert's at, what, 9%? If he gets a spike down, Swampert's dead in the water. Whereas if he doesn't, I've seen Swampert's come back from that level of health. It, it, it takes a while, but this game has taken a while. So at this point, Teclis has to find a crit on the Blissey because she can just keep healing off his damage forever. And now Teclis tries it again, but Starmaster can just keep going after this fortress every single time. He does elect to get up the spikes. Does he have some sort of plan to try and mitigate what Starmaster's Fortress can do in the coming turns? He does not. However, Starmaster is going to elect to just get his spikes up, or excuse me, get Teclis's spikes off instead. Because he realizes that the amount of switching he's doing is really going to damage his own team with a spike up more than Teclis's would. Having the option to switch back and forth between. First of all, the fortress that doesn't take damage from sand is going to be getting 12 back every time it comes in and takes 12. And what? Hold on. Starmaster's Bliss here reveals counter, waiting a really long time for that. He pulls the trigger at the right time, going to take out Teclis' Salamence, and this game suddenly looks strongly in Starmaster's favor. It's going to be 5-3 to him. That being said, Aerodactyl is low. Aerodactyl can't really take a hit. Fortress is healthy. Blissey has Wish. So here's an important turn that just happened. It's actually super interesting that this just happened. I don't know exactly if Teclis expected Spikes or if he expected Rapid Spin. However, He's getting more help back from leftovers than Fortress's Rapid Spin did to him. That means next turn he can he can either 
you know, eat another rapid. Well, he's not going to be rapid spin. He could protect off whatever damage Fortress would put out, get back up to 18%, and then be able to take two layers of spikes. Or, you know, he actually, yeah, that seems like the best thing to do. And then you have an opportunity to try and pass a wish to him later and get him back to full health. So that's still going to take some fancy maneuvering. However, and Starmaster does go for spikes. So you're going to see Swamper getting back up to even more health if he stays in. I'm going to throw out a Toxic, and this is just prolonging how long Teclos is able to stay alive. Listening, not going to mind the toxic too much. What's important is that there are turns happening where Swamper doesn't take damage. It is the exact thing I was talking about earlier. Granted, this is still an uphill battle for Teclas, but you know, some smart play and some smart switching can can make it happen. So we're faced with a situation where, uh, you know, Jirachi is still the best way for Star to kill the fortress. And it can really come in without too much difficulty, but we have Teclas continually maneuvering this Swamper around to, to get it, you know, quite a bit of health back. The next turn is going to be up to 40%. And he seems to understand that whatever that last move is from Fortress, could be Explosion, could be um, HP Bug. Well, you're not going to run on Fortress that Explosion, but, you know, there are options such as HP Bug and HP Ghost, or, God forbid, Zap Cannon. And it's just not really an option for, for Swamper to be getting hit by anything except for Rapid Spin. And to keep stacking this even further, Teclas is going to get the Lucky Freeze onto Star Master's Fortress, and that gives them the opportunity to start putting out some real damage. Not a whole lot of things that want to come in on, on those seismic tosses right now. Jirachi, ultimately not going to mind it too much. 25% is going to be able to nullify that with every wish that it throws out. And Teclas seems to understand that, and he's now looking for a second freeze. Really, uh trying to cash in his chips in this week. Blissey will get toxic. That's not a huge concern, you know, in the long run. Blissey's never going to get too hurt by it, but it's certainly going to keep Teclas for doing this for more than, you know, 12 turns. So with that, we have Swamper coming back in on the Wish. Smart play by Teclas. Going to get another 6%. Blissey comes in, going to eat a Toxic immediately. Another smart play. Teclas making a lot of great plays, but, you know, he has obviously fallen behind in this game. Not to say that Starmaster hasn't made great plays of his own. Jirachi comes back in on the Blissey, and Starmaster seems to be comfortable with the idea that the Jirachi can really do whatever it wants. And I don't even think that Surf from Swampert is going to be able to hurt it that much. The only reason that he keeps going out to Blissey is just that there is a threat of crit. And, you know, Blissey can't crit. So Teclas keeps looking for those uh, freezes. Not able to find them. But, you know, I have to imagine that this game is winding down pretty soon. They can't keep doing this forever. And it looks like Starmaster is going to agree. He's going to make the swap out to... Or he's going to make the Seismic Toss play on the swap out to Swamper. And a lot of the work that we've seen Teclas do in the last 30 turns is going to go wasted. His immediate 28% damage is going to just wear a lot of that down. However, there's a very real opportunity for Swamper to get this wish pass to him. And that would certainly extend the game even further. Starmaster does show the fire punch, and it is going to immediately get the burn onto Swamper, which 
plays a big part. Instead of gaining six, it's going to be losing six every round. And, uh, you know, Refresh comes out, but that gives Jirachi another turn to try and do what it wants. Fortress comes back in, going to receive a wish from Blissey. And it's going to have an opportunity, once again, to try and thaw out. Possibly try and get up spikes. Possibly try and keep up spikes. Or to just explode. You know, at this point, you have to wonder if an explosion would... Uh... There's only three Pokemon left for, for Teclas. If you take out one of them, that's going to be huge. So Starmaster going to get up one layer. Bring Jirachi back in. Jirachi not going to mind the ice cream too much. And Starmaster has played this with a lot of discipline. It seems like it would really have been easy to try and maneuver your Aerodactyl in and then just eat a eat an ice beam when you're trying to get it a wish, but he didn't. And we're going to see Fortress healed all the way back up to full. Blissey's going to try and get the freeze. And Starmaster's just going to pull the trigger, explode, going <laughs> to blow on the nurse's face, and Teclis is just going to forfeit right there. So that's, that's going to be the end of our second game. Uh, you know, I really like the team that Teclas brought, the uh, the double flyers. You know, it's always a lot of fun to see that kind of thing. It, I don't know, I liked it a lot. Starmaster maneuvered around it well. He was able to mitigate the damage that that fortress should have been able to do from Teclas. Uh, honestly, neither of them did a whole lot of damage that game, apart from the explosion at the very end. But they both had to care about it a lot. So with that in mind, I'm going to go to our third game now which is going to be Cyber Odin versus Golden Sun. Cyber Odin on the alias I Love You Jesus. Golden Sun on February Stars, both aliases that they are known as, the alts that they go by. We're going to get into it right now. Looking at the lead matchup, we have a Zapdos from Golden Sun and a lead Swamper from... Hold on. Lead Swamper from Cyber Odin? That's a little clunky. But, you know... If that's just a regular old Swampert, it's not going to be able to threaten us at those too much due to the risk of having HP grass. So he's going to immediately swap out to Blissey, which is not going to mind anything that that Zapdos does unless it is some sort of um, minus defense drill pack kind of thing. And whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. We saw... Didn't this just happen? Yeah, we just had this happen in our first game with Markop. Golden Sun is going to play the same exact thing here. I'm going to have a Zapdos BP out into a Dug Trio and catch the Blissey on turn two. But what? He, there. So are there no nicknames or is he screwing around? I mean, he's going to get a free Blissey on turn two, which is immediately going to put him miles ahead. But you, <laughs> everything that hasn't been revealed. I mean, is he really going to have Jirachi in? He could. This just seems like a huge call-out from Golden Sun, honestly. He's saying, I know what you're going to be bringing, and I know how you're going to play, and you will be punished for it. Doug Trio, as usual, going to live the Ice Beam. It is EV to do that. And on the next turn, it is going to take out the Blissey from Cyberone. And importantly, this thing will live a spike. It can come in on spikes, and it can revenge kill something in the future. That being said, Swamp are going to come in now. And, yep, there it is, Jirachi. This is a Jirachi, by the way. You guys remember the movie where, uh, where May and Max met a Jirachi at the circus, and it looked just like this? And then they sang a song? Yep, that was my favorite part, when the green Jirachi... So, clearly Golden Sun is screwing with Cyber Road, and then he's screwing with me, too. And all of his names are going to be messed up with the exception of Zapdos and Dugtrio, knowing that obviously your Zapdos' name doesn't matter and your Dugtrio's name doesn't matter. So 
Zapdos reveals that it's probably HP Grass. So, Cyber and making the right play to swap that out fast earlier. And a critical hit, actually going to chunk that Zapdos pretty hard. I'm surprised. 20 hits a lot of damage. And now Cyber Odin going to Thunder Wave, Golden Sun, Zapdos. They're going to trade Thunder Waves. Both Zapdoses are paralyzed, and both are now just slow, bulky attackers. Titar going to be revealed for Golden Sun. Um, there, this could be a Pursuit Tar. It could be some sort of weird BP double trap team. But Swampert is going to come back in, and we're not going to find out. Is Golden Sun going to double back out to Celebi? Still three unrevealed for Cyber Odin. Celebi is going to calm mind up immediately, so this very well could be Baton Fast. If only because we saw Golden Sun Baton Fast so aggressively with the Zapdos. Yeah, there's the BP. And here's the Aerodactyl, the Swampert. And with plus one special attack, it's going to immediately threaten a lot of things. Ice Beam going to do a big 68%. Uh, Zapdos reveals Hidden Power Grass. Not going to do much due to the aforementioned Calm Mind. And this suddenly looks very threatening. It's important to know, Swampert has shown leftovers. So it is, you know, while it can be an offensive set, it is not like a salad or anything like that. Meanwhile, Cyberon going to reveal his Cloister, going to have an opportunity to get up some important layers of spikes, considering uh, everything except Zapdos has been grounded so far. But it's still going to be chunked pretty hard by the Swamper. Golden Sun elects to pull out the Swamper on threat of an explosion upcoming, and he's going to go to something faster that can get off a rapid spin, even if there is an explosion coming out. Instead, he decides to just Thunderbolt, take out the Cloister, and he's now basically able to rapid spin for free. I mean, this Swampert's not going to threaten it. Spikes go off, and this is a very commanding game for Cyber, or for, excuse me, for Golden Sun. Cyber Odin has just not been in a strong position literally since turn one. Turn, since the lead matchup of Zapdos with HP Grass and Baton Pass versus Defensive Swamper. That being said, that's going to matter a lot. Whatever this last is, I've certainly seen stranger things happen. His last is going to be a Gengar. And I'm surprised that he didn't reveal that earlier. It's going to do a lot of work, but it's not going to ultimately can't outspeed the Starmie. Which means no matter what, the Starmie is in a commanding position. It's going to be able to threaten everything that Cyber Room has brought. Focus Punch being loaded up from Golden Sun. However, the Tyranitar is going to be flinched by a regular old HP grass from the side of Brofist the Gengar. And Gengar cleans up the Tyranitar, but at this point, you know, you got to imagine. Well, smart play from Golden Sun. Starmie's not going to be able to take out that Gengar in one hit, so you do want to weaken it first. Tyranitar being parrot is not going to make things easier. Um, you know, it eats its Lumberry. You're going to need to have the Zapdos get full parrot here and then, you know, set up a DD. However, Cyberone decides to go for the raw damage. He's trying to weaken what he can, presumably, for this Gengar and for the Swampert, because he knows things are not ideal for that T-Tar. Swampert going to come in on the Hydro Pump, which misses, which is going to, you know, create sort of an opportunity for Odin. But he's going to need some good freezes here if he wants to uh, make things happen. He's going to reveal Roar, which is going to bring in Dugtrio, which is going to be able to throw out some damage on the Swampert. I don't think you swap out from it. You know, you don't really have a safe switch in if you can help it. Dugtrio's not really trapping anything super important at this point. The Tyranitar is paralyzed. So you take your free damage. You're going you're gonna to chop the Swampert in half. 
Gengar is still pretty healthy. So at this point, you just try and keep getting kills with your Swampert. Very disciplined play coming out of Golden Sun. Oh, I just scrolled up 60 turns. Gengar now coming back in. Not disciplined to play there from Odin. Gonna bring his Gengar in. Gonna go down to 8% uh, off of a Hydro Pump. But 8%'s not dead. Sand is not gonna take him out. And he does have an opportunity to throw out an attack or two here. Which, for the record, will threaten this Swampert immediately. He makes... Whoa! He is awarded for a great prediction. Able to drop the Zapdos with a single Ice Punch critical hit prediction. Good on him. However, Starmie comes in now. And nothing from Cyberone is going to be able to eat this Hydro Pump. He goes for the Ice Beam instead. Um, I suppose if he has last, last attack, recover. He doesn't need Hydro Pump, obviously. But irregardless, Starmie's going to clean all this up anyway. We have to be coming to the end of this battle here, and it it got a little closer than I was expecting, really, but I really don't... Okay, well, I was going to say, I don't really see a path for path for Cyber to try and pull this back. However, if you did have a path, it would certainly start with a crit onto the Swamper. However, Golden Sun Swamper, much faster, should be able to land... Uh, another Hydro Pump. But these protects are going to slowly start bringing the health back. Odin's done a great job of preserving this Swampert. You know, the fact that it's lasted this long. It was on the on the back foot from turn one. That being said, it did get frozen, and that is going to close it out. There's nothing that Odin can do about it at this point. And it's just formalities now, you... You finish off the Swamper, you sack your own, and then you bring in Starmie, and you click Ice Beam. And that's exactly what will happen here. All right, so with that, we're going to have our third win of the night. Congratulations to Golden Sun and to our first two winners of uh, Star and who won the first game? Markov? Yeah, Markov was super lucky. And with that, we're going to take a quick break, you know, take a few minutes, grab a drink, get some popcorn, because we've got two bangers coming at you next after this break. Who's that Pokemon?
All right, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your break. Hope you're ready to go into these last two battles. Because first things first, we got Zomog versus Zaire. Zomog, another longtime player, fantastic ADD player, going up, up against Lanier. And, uh, you know, should be a great game. Um, BKC did a video covering this game. I watched through the, uh, the first part of it, and it gave me a couple important insights that uh, I'm excited to share with any of you guys if you don't watch his channel, and you should. So we're going to start off immediately. And the first thing that I do want to point out is that the Zapdos is shiny. And what matters about that is that it doesn't have Baton Pass, which, you know, if you're not trying to run a Baton Pass Zapdos, so be it. But you don't need your opponent to know that. So, you know, if you're doing it on purpose, then yeah, whatever. But if you're not, that's a bit of a misstep on Zomog's part. But it's one that he should know. So I can't imagine that he just did it for no reason. Lanier is going to immediately swap out to his to his um, fortress here, and we are going to have a second fortress revealed. So we might be in for another long game here, folks. Both players are going to get up a spot. Not nearly playing the spikes game as hard as we saw uh, Starmaster and Teclas doing. You're gonna have very little damage coming out from that. T-tar, and I have to imagine this just that it was a bulky Zapdos as opposed to being some weak T-tar. Zapdos is going to throw out a Toxic and immediately catch the T-tar, who is now going to be on a timer, 6% per turn, uh, going to nullify any damage that you would expect to see from uh, a Leftovers. We didn't even see Leftovers there. Fortress is going to come back in, possibly be able to throw off a spin. Not much revealed from Zomong's team yet. Both players only revealing three Pokemon so far. Thunderbolt going to take Fortress down to 20%, going to brought up to 25% after Leftovers, but it is going to get the Rapid Spin off importantly, and Spikes are going to be cleared from the near side. Now Zomog going to bring his own Fortress back in, going to look for the opportunity to throw out his own Rapid Spin. However, Lanier keeps the initiative, is going to bring in his Snorlax. Very interesting looking team. You would think it's a pretty... Uh, whoa, hold on. You would think it's a pretty basic looking physical offense, the exception of this fortress, which is just sitting there in the middle of it all, uh, a little bit clunky, but this Snorlax is going to throw out a yawn, which is, you know, you don't want your fortress to fall asleep. So, you know, you'd have to imagine there's a focus punch or something coming out on the planned switch. Snorlax is going to load up a focus punch. We are going to see the Swamper come back in. And it's going to take that pretty well. 32%, not a ton of damage. You, know, you get another 6% from leftovers next turn, but you can't keep, keep taking hits from that. It seems as though Lanier has all of his names revealing. Oh, alts revealed. There you go. <laughs> Shows how much attention I pay. However, the Swampert is going to be able to keep sitting on this Zapdos for the time being. Uh, current power level unknown on whether it has HP Ice or if it has HP Grass. However, if it's HP Ice, it's certainly going to make things more difficult for Lanier because nothing on Zomok's team really cares about it too much. Oh, but Blissey will be revealed for Zomog. And Lanier is going to be able to bring his Snorlax in basically for free. This spike is going to start stacking up on the Snorlax, though. That being said, nothing asleep on Lanier's, or on Zomog's side. So you can keep throwing out these yawns, keep putting these one-turn clocks on Pokemon. You know, you can do what you want, but you can't stay awake for it. And it's really going to let him keep his front foot forward. And Lanier will use that opportunity to get another 6% onto his fortress. Uh, remains to be seen whether that's really best in the long run, because... Ultimately, he can't stay in super long. We're, we're going to have the T-Tar come in, which I have to imagine would also be special. Because there's nothing else that really looks like it would be throwing out pursuits. And there's the Fire Blast. So that is going to reveal that it's special. You could have pursued it just there, I suppose. I don't know exactly how much damage Pursuit will do to a Fortress, but if it was, uh, if it was you know, within 18%, then that's a dead Fortress. No, hold on. 
Oh my god, I'm blanking out. 12%. It was within 12%, then you have a dead fortress on your side. So both of these Pokemon just throwing out their special moves for the time being and taking it rather well, all things considered. And we just have two weirdly bulky offensive teams. None of them are really going to be too bothered by each other's attacks. But both of them are going to have to start finding some way to create an advantage, to create an opening for them to start lengthening that advantage sooner or later. Zomog has not yet revealed his sixth, while Linear has revealed all six. Linear goes back out of his Zapdos, makes the Swampert with an Earthquake, and he does have the opportunity to throw out an attack. He, uh, I almost said he could Baton Pass. We had that whole talk earlier about how he very specifically cannot Baton Pass. Hidden power gets revealed, and you have to imagine that that is grass, and that it is going to threaten up the Swampert immediately. And the last move going to be shown for Zomog Zapdos will be Roar. And, you know, depending on what set this Tyranitar is, Zapdos could maybe just keep roaring out. You know, Crunch going to do a good 30%. And Zomog elects to get the damage on the T-Tar instead, going to do a big 34%, another 12% down next turn. And that's a dead T-Tar if, uh, if Zomog stays in. But he elects not to. Toxic is going to do the work for him. And Salomon swaps back in on the Swampert switch. A hidden Power Grass immediately going to take out that Swampert. And is going to be our first knockout of the game. He's going to give Lanier a one-mon lead. And Blissey is going to be very low. That being said, I don't know if this Salamence can take down the Blissey from 17%. And Lanier's time is very low. I still wish we had some way to replay these replays in the time that they happened. But, you know, I, we have no way of knowing how much time... Well, we do have a way of knowing. If you go to Lanier's YouTube channel, the Linear Curve ADD, you can see his super in-depth stuff for these battles, too. So Fortress comes back out, going to try and eat away at these sleep turns. Not going to mind a return too much. Um, still no last Mon revealed for Zomog. Lanier's going to load up a Focus Punch, which is going to land. He's going to bonk Fortress for 33%. However, we're going to see Fortress be able to take one more. Linear loads up another one. We're going to see another bonk for 30, 35%. 36%. High roller coming through. Linear curve, 777. That being said, oh my goodness. Still no wake up. Max sleep turns. Return is get, still not get the job done. Oh my gosh. So mod is... Uh... Wow, what an interesting interaction. Both The fact that they both made it out alive to do that. And Forger still hasn't woken up. Finally, the Forger gets sacked. Spikes will remain on Zomog's side forever. Zapdos comes back in, and this Thunderbolt should take out the T-Tar next turn. Salamence comes back in. Not going to want to take that Thunderbolt too well either. That is down to 35%. The next one will kill. However, we do see that I believe the Salamence is faster after how leftovers were shown. Turn turn not bothered by the Dragon Claw too much. is going to get an opportunity to throw out an attack here. And the Crunch will take down the Salamence. And with the Salamence's dying breath, it will get off a wish, which will be going to the Swampert. Going to be able to heal the Swampert back up to a pretty good stat line. I don't know exactly how much the, damage, the, the attack from his T-Tar is going to do. And Zomog finally reveals his last one, which is going to be a Breloom, which is uh, the T-Tar counter. And Breloom is going to threaten Lanier's team with, first of all, with a Spore. Second of all, with some really hard-hitting fighting type attacks. So there's the Spore. 
Now, can Zomog start cracking holes in Lanier's team with this? Zapdos Society certainly has the, uh, the tools to do so. However, Zomog guesses right that Lanier brought a uh, Sleep Talk Zapdos set. And it's going to roll the Thunderbolt and flinch the Breloom before it can throw out a Focus Punch. So suddenly that plan is off the table. Breloom's down to 55%, 42%, 43% next time it comes in off of Spikes plus Sand, and that thing's going to get worn down pretty quickly. There's another Spike off of a Sleep Talk Roar, and Lanier's really hitting his, uh, his moves here. Lissy comes back in looking for an opportunity to possibly at least throw out a soft boil to get itself back up to health. And Lanier actually predicts the wake up and he throws out a Thunderbolt. Going to keep this Blissey at low health. Blissey will get off the soft boil, but the roars just keep coming. And what was, what was Tyrant's around? 50%? Yeah, you're going to see this team start getting worn down real quick. And this Zapdos is going to get a lot of work done here. Uh, Thunderbolt, critical hit, going to wear down this Blissey even more. Uh, there's a real opportunity to try and bring something in if you want to try and force the issue. However, we are going to see Zapdos take a Toxic and throw out another Roar, which is going to keep the Blissey at 25% next turn. That's huge. Tyranitar comes in, stays at 44%. Should be able to take a Thunderbolt from this Zapdos. However, Crunch did nothing. Wow. Linear in a very commanding position right now. And this is going to reveal that it is also rest, not just some random sleep talk Gen 5 black white OU type beat. It's going to be back up to 100%, not going to be toxic anymore. This Tyranitar, though, it's slowly going to get its health back with leftovers. There's still the risk of it eating a random Thunderbolt via sleep talk, which it does not hit this turn. So. Lanier has another opportunity to try and find a spadef drop, find a crit, something of that sort, to maybe turn the tides in his favor. Because it is still a 4-5 to five game. Pokemon are kind of low on Zomog's team, but uh, as long as you can... Well, no, this is looking pretty bleak. But Zapdos is the real thing keeping that Breloom from popping off. And if you can get it out of the way... Zapdos wakes up and elects to just drop the T-Tar then and there. Doesn't want to keep risking with these crunches. Blissey goes down to 25%. Now, how do you want to deal with this, Lanier? Zapdos decides to play the long game, immediately rests back up. And a seismic toss from Blissey, not going to really do that much damage. It's not zero damage. You know, 26% is going to stack up, but... Rest means that you can kind of wait it out in a sense. You know, you use three seismic tosses for every one rest. Really, at this point, Lanier can, uh, without knowing what move the Snorlax has, I can't imagine it would have, like, self destruct last. That would be insane. But if you can boom with your Fortress. Nothing, well, it's still so low. That's a hard play to make. Again, Lanier has the tools to make this happen, but it's really difficult to call it. Snorlax's going to do a big 40% with the return, and that's also not going to be enough, but Zomog will kind of have to keep healing up with Blissey. And instead, Lanier, or excuse me, Zomog elects to sack his Zapdos. I assume he wants to get the Breloom back in, which will absolutely be the Snorlax. We'll be able to throw off a Spore. And we'll be able to start turning this game back in Zomok's favor. He made the intelligent play, knew that whatever was coming in was going to be an easy sack. Didn't throw out the Spore. Oh, we're at the Zapdos coming back in. And this is doable, I suppose. <laughs> but Zomog needs to get really lucky. Well, no. That was the end of Zapdos' sleep turns via rest. And that looks like it's going to be GG. I mean, at this point, you look for an opportunity 
this is a toxic listy, right? Yeah. You can get Snorlax in. You throw out a yawn and then a focus punch, and there's really not a whole lot that Zomar can do about it. And we are just going through formalities here. They're formalities I wish we didn't have to go through, but with any luck, Zomog is going to call it before too long. In fact, I am going to speed it up to uh, get through this because, frankly, I don't think either of us want to. Both my audience and myself don't really want to chill out for this. But if anything cool happens, I'll be sure to let y'all know. Overall, well played by Lanier. You know, Zomog certainly had some scary threats, but Lanier's uh, intelligent team building was able to let him maneuver around the threats that Zomog brought. In particular, bringing the Sleep Talk Zapdos, which is really not a set these days, uh, able to stop the Breloom in its tracks. But we just gotta... This is a part of ADVOU too, guys. We all gotta do these games every once in a while. It's difficult to tell with, with pressure what PP is like. But with both self-boiled and wish. Let's, uh, let's go hyper fast, y'all. Let's get this over with. This player's doing this specifically just to annoy me. So does Snorlax have the boom? Yes, he does. All right. That will end the game. Good job, Lanier. Good job, Zomog. Oh, my goodness. All right. Um, with that, we're going to go into the last game here. It's going to be Tomahome versus Endil. Now, let's just go straight into it after that game. All right, set things to slow. We're going to have the lead matchup here going to have Zapdos on Suicune, obviously immediately favoring Endel. Um, however, you know, Suicune can certainly take a Thunderbolt from a Zapdos if Tomahome really wants to. Immediate swap to Blissey. This already looks like, like a really, uh, really bulky, stally team. Um, you know, I would not be shocked if they were in it for the long haul. Maybe a mag in the back. I've seen so many teams that start with blue and then pink and then Magdal. And it, you know, they're good teams. They're great teams. And I'm not going to say they're not. Speaking of first two months, Zapdos to Celebi also immediately says, you know, heavy baton pass team, uh, you know, physical threats in the back, probably a trapper. So this game could uh, go one of two ways. Celebi going to throw out a Leech Seed. Taking that 12% from Blissey is going to do a lot for this Celebi. It's going to be like 20% every round. They're going to be able to completely mitigate anything that this Blissey tries to do. So Tomahome says, F that. I'm going to go get some spikes up. Baton Pass comes out from Celebi, and the immediate Starmie will be revealed. And that is going to be a pain in Tomahome's backside for the rest of this game, I have to imagine. Granted, Blissey and Sweetening don't care too much about it, but that Skarmory sure does. Thunder Wave going to paralyze this Blissey, and Rapid Spin immediately going to remove those spikes. So those are gone. Blissey gets full parrot, and they'll manage to get off 100% scot free there. And he's going to try and double dip, take another 14% damage with a Surf. Going to eat 30% for it from a Seismic Toss. Not going to care too much. Um, 
if it's thunder wave, then it's probably going to have recover. Celebi comes back in. Seems to be Endil's main switch into this Blissey. Leech Seed is just going to let it keep sapping off health. However, he decides to put Tonpass straight back into the Skarmory. I think he expected the Skarmory to come back in. Tamaho maybe being a little less assertive about his spikes than Endil was expecting. And Skarmory is going to eat another 30% for its hubris. However, immediately... Excuse me. Immediate recover. Going to bring it back up to full. Still no sand up. So these Pokemon are going to be incredibly bulky. Going to be getting their 6% back every turn. Not going to be uh, stopped by the sand. Skarmory now comes back in, takes the Leech Seed from Celebi, which is going to start slowly wearing it down, especially with the Leech Seed. Even if Skarmory were to click Protect, it would still be taking some health every turn. And here comes Suicune from Tomahome. I'm going to try and get off a little bit of damage. However, Endil staying on top of it, but does Baton Pass. And another Baton Pass from a Zapdos. And now Titar is revealed. This Titar clearly seems to be one that kind of... Um, threatens the Celebi, and I think, first of all, we have a Focus Punch getting loaded up. Not going to do too much damage to this Clay Doll. Clay Doll is going to threaten it out with an Earthquake. Speaking of which, Clay Doll, as I mentioned, probably a Magneton somewhere back here. I want to say, I think these are like Marty Friedman names. Yeah. So, shout out to Endel for that. Always fun to do music for your nicknames. However, Tomahome is now playing a little more aggressive with these spikes. A little more fast and loose, hoping to get him up. But every turn that Endil predicts and just BPs out, that's another 6% that Tomahome is going to get. So Claydol comes back in for Tomahome. going to not worry too much about the Thunderbolt. He's going to not worry about a Thunder Wave on that Zapdos' side as well. So, you know, you're really going to only fear the Hidden Power, which hasn't even been revealed yet. And these two players are just going back and forth with these swaps. So before too long, you kind of raise the question of how, how do you advance your position here? How do you make things better? We've seen that this Starmie doesn't really mind spikes. It's not gonna, it's not gonna fear the Skarmory with both natural cure and recover. So it's kind of up to Tomahawk to try and well. That's also difficult to say. You want to say that it's up to Tomahome to try and make things happen, but he has such a passive team that, you know, it is kind of wrecked by Starmie. So he has something in the back that doesn't mind Starmie so much, that's willing to take the hits or, you know, maybe outspeed, which you're not going to see on a stall team, but I'm not really sure what other options he has, aside from just stalling out all of its, uh, all of its damage, all of its PP. So it seems like this might, uh, it'll be a while, if I have to imagine. And you look at the Pokemon revealed, both players have this, this rock-solid defensive core. Neither of them really need to reveal anything else. Tomaho may be getting a little antsy now, throwing out these seismic tosses, get Celebi down to 50%. And I have to imagine this Celebi probably doesn't have recover. You know, you'd expect at least one attack. Zapdos comes back in. And I'm surprised that there's been no uh, protects yet out of Skarmory. It could possibly be a YOLO Skarm or something. It's trying to stay fast, stay mobile, but. Tyranitar is now going to come in on the Blissey, and Endil, this is an important turn for him, he has an opportunity to try and make something happen. 
And it's Tomahome that actually makes that happen instead. He's going to predict the focus punch, get a seismic toss, and he's going to get a free 24% damage onto Endil's Tyranitar. Not the craziest number at the moment, but if he can get a set of spikes to stick, then we could see things uh, go the other way. Now starting to see damage rack up on this Starmie, and Starmie is going to be forced to recover for the next couple turns. So if there's anything else that this Blissey can do, and it is just going to be the Seismic Toss. Pardon me if I'm not saying a lot at the moment. There's not really a ton for me to say. We've seen the same cycle of turns go for about uh, 30 turns now. So at this point, it really feels like Endil is like the more comfortable one here. He's he's got the baton passes, he's got the super effective moves, and Tomahome is the one that's forced to react to him. So we may see him potentially try and force the issue now. So he does get a calm mind up on a speaker. I'm gonna chunk that zap that was pretty hard. I don't know exactly how much a baton pass thunderbolt is gonna do to a plus one sweet coon, but instead Endil just baton passes back out to Celebi. Which is also not going to mind this surf very much. And Celebi does reveal the, uh, the recover. So this is a deceptively long-term team. This leech seed surely going to start wearing down the Suicune, but what is this? Calm Mind Surf Rest Roar? That would make a lot of sense. Play all comes back out on the Zapdos. And I keep saying that these players need to try and make something happen, but they really don't. They're, you know, this is SPL. It's the highest competition. Like, they, they, they understand that they are perfectly capable of playing the long game. They're perfectly capable of running down the PP of the opponent and try and figuring it out in the end game. But, man, do I not want to watch it. Suicune reveals rest. It importantly rested without any boosts. And depending on what this Celebi's last move is, could be Giga Drain, could be H or, or Hidden Power Grass if you're looking for some extra PP. But he is just going to elect the Taunt Pass back to Zapdos. Going to be able to throw out a Thunderbolt or possibly a Hidden Power if you're looking to predict the play all. And no. I think I'm going to move it up to normal speed. Yeah, we're going to speed it up just a little bit. Until at least another Pokemon gets revealed here. Starmie's going to recover on the incoming Suicune. Suicune's going to get a chance to try and burn off a couple of these sleep turns. Celebi comes in for free. Going to be able to Leech Seed the Suicune at the very least. And it does reveal Hidden Power Grass. Suicune is going to wake up and get a Calm Mind off. Going to take that HP Grass a lot better this turn. And is going to immediately rest. So perhaps we can see things start happening now. Leech Seed is going to slowly start sapping away at Suicune's health. However, with rest, that's ultimately 
only going to cost him about a turn extra every cycle that we have here. Now the thing is, Zapdos is going to slowly start getting held back from that, but it didn't. Okay, whoa. So he had Endil that time trying to predict Claydol with the hidden power. And props where it's due. Fantastic play from Tomahome, not going to the Claydol, predicting that that's what was going to be happening that turn because it would have been very easy to get bonked there. Finally, we have new Pokemon being revealed. Metagross is going to be real for Endel, and that's certainly going to uh, threaten what we've seen from Tomahome. You know, nothing that we saw is going to want to really take too many hits from that Metagross. Skarmory doesn't mind the first couple, but considering we never saw Protect from that Skarmory, if it doesn't have it, then you can't take more than three hits or so. Especially if you chance it and get a uh, attack raise. So Suicune is now going to get its plus one, plus one. And probably going to rest here. No, it is going to surf, get a little bit of early damage off on the Celebi, just in case of a Baton Pass. Baton Pass to Zapdos is not something that would want to take a surf, being at 68%. I want to say the surf did, like, what, 45% last time? I'm not going to go all the way up and look, but I remember the Zapdos being at 53% for a while. Suicune is going to get the rest off safely. And Celebi Baton Bass is back out. I'm shocked that there was no attempt at a Leech Seed there. However, um, Celebi has to be very low on Leech Seeds. I mentioned before that pressure is a little wonky. You don't see exactly how much is shown, so I couldn't tell you exactly. It's definitely less than 9 Leech Seeds. We are back to this loop. However, now that the Metagross has been revealed, I have to imagine that it'll get its time in the limelight a little more often. So at this point, we will speed it back up just a little bit. Back up to normal speed as these players go back through their loops again. Oh, what did I just do? Oh, I just switched sides. Okay. I was terrified that I'd accidentally like restarted the entire battle. So Metagross is finally going to come back in, and he's going to be able to throw out a Meteor Mash here. Uh, probably not going to hit the Blissey, however, both Claydol and Skarmory are comfortable targets for that Meteor Mash. First one's going to miss. Uh, not going to make this any easier on Indel. After all these turns, his first opportunity to try and make something happen, he's going to immediately run back to the Starmie. I think he may have started wondering what kind of Skarmory set this as well, because he does not want his Metagross to take an attack. Because, I mean, if you think about it, no spikes up, Roar isn't going to be a threat. Um, so, you know, the only thing we'd be concerned about is if there was a hidden power ground. And now we're back to this stuff. Suicune calm mines up once. Is Celebi going to throw out a Leech Seed here, or is it going to baton pass straight out to Zapdos? Probably not, because Zapdos doesn't want to take that surf. Celebi throws out a hidden power. Not going to do a ton, however, Suicune's going to keep going for it. We could have our opportunity here, folks. Tomahome created for himself the perfect scenario in which Celebi came in while Suicune was at 100% and getting plus one, plus one. And a critical hit is going to do 40 damage to Celebi, going to force recover next turn, I would imagine. I don't 
Selby hasn't used many of its recovers, but Suicune is going to get its rest off on the recover turn. Starmory comes back in, and Celebi immediately baton passes out. Zapdos is going to re-enter the field. But now Endil has shown his hand, he has shown that he has hidden power, and, you know, things get a little clunkier for Tom Home going forward. That being said, it's not like if he clicked Thunderbolt, it was going to be doing much more to Blissey. So baton pass straight into Metagross, going to get another opportunity to redeem itself. Skarmory comes in, and the Meteor Mesh does connect. Endil stays in on the spike from Starmory. Gonna get another 20% off on this Skarmory. Gonna start wearing it down, I would imagine. Oh, and that critical hit is gonna kind of speed up the process, I suppose. Skarmory does use Roar, but 19% is not a great health for it to be at. Lissy's gonna come back in on the Thunderbolt from Endil. Kind of had to force it there. You didn't really have an option to, to not just in case you know you get an extra layer up or something like that. And now Endo will baton pass back out to his Starmie, who's going to be able to rapid spin for free. Left for free. That's a pretty hefty amount of damage. It's not really one you can ignore. Suicune will get an opportunity to burn off a couple of uh, sleep turns here. Or one sleep turn. And now we are approaching the same loop that we've done for 90 turns now, but that's okay. This is ADV2. Suicune will get up one calm mind. How many is he going to be able to get before he rests? We'll get up two Calm Minds. Next Hidden Power Grass is going to be doing roughly 18%. So he does have the opportunity to get up a third if he wants to force the issue. And Celebi will be using Leech Seed now on the Suicune's Rest. Skarmory comes back in, looking to get a little bit of leftovers here. However, Endo smartly baton passes out to Tyranitar. It's only shown Focus Punch. We don't really know what else it could have. It does reveal Fire Blast, which is going to hit the Clay all for a decent amount. Definitely better than the Focus Punch would have. And that is going to reveal that it is some sort of mixed set without knowing exactly what kind of... Uh, without knowing exactly what kind of you know, investment it has. It reveals Crunch. So I imagine it would be Crunch Pursuit, Focus Punch, Fire Blast. And suddenly the clay doll is at a bit of a clunky health number. Jirachi gets revealed. So both players only have one Pokemon left to be revealed. And this Jirachi is honestly going to make things last a little bit longer. Because suddenly you have a fresh Mon with fresh wishes. But importantly it does not have pressure. Which means the Celebi has a lot less to be afraid of. And Skarmory is going to get wished up here. That's really epic. Skarmory back up to 80%, however, Zapdos is in on it, and Claydol is importantly very low health. So you can move a little more freely, freely now, you don't need to worry about that thing coming in and... Okay, who? Let me finish my thought real quick, Jesus. You know, Claydol doesn't get to come in for free on the Focus Punches anymore, and nothing else on this team so far really wants to take the Focus Punch too many times. So... This is an important play, and considering everything has those aforementioned nicknames, I would assume that this is another beat-up Dug Trio, which, for whatever reason, was there was a ton of this week. But this is immediately going to speed things up. Um, I don't know what the last is, but it can take out Jirachi depending on the set, and it will be taking out the Blissey, so... 
you know, you might see the scale slowly start to tip in Endel's favor here. And that Ice Beam is actually going to kill the Doug Trio. However, kind of lucky, that beat up is going to put Blissey within range of sand. So Tomahome is going to go back to Jirachi, and Endel just immediately baton passes out. Brings back in the Celebi. Going to not mind that Thunder too much. Thunder, important note, does have the 30% paralysis rate. Going to be up to 60% by Jirachi's Serene Grace. And Wish Thunder, that's a really odd set. Interesting to see what else he has. Claydol comes in, uh, presumably to receive this Wish. However, Starmie does get in for free, and it is going to be able to throw out attacks relatively unhindered now that Blissey's gone, because now Suicune is the one that had to take these hits. And Suicune is going to have its hands full trying to do double duty of both checking Starmie and checking Metagross and checking um, and trying to set up and win. Because at this point, Suicune is Tomahome's win condition. There's nothing else on his team that's able to sort of threaten that. And that happened. Okay. So what I think happened here I think that, so here's the situation. <laughs> Zapdos is the only flyer on Endil's team. And that means that if Endil Baton passes out, he has to go into something that, he has to go into something that isn't flying type. And literally, the Celebi's at 100%, but... Like, nothing, if this is an Adam and Doug or something, nothing really takes an attack from it super well. So I have to imagine that he was expecting the baton pass here. But I want to make it very clear. There's no way in hell that Endil expected the, the Doug Trio to come in. He probably expected the Claydol to come in. I wanted to get out an early hit with his hidden power. But this happened... And things could really start picking up for Endil now. So now Endil with Ton passes out. He's going to bring in Metagross. Not going to mind that Thunder too much. However, a pair on the next turn could make it a little bit clunky. Earthquake going to do 50%. We do see Earthquake, or we do see leftovers on this Metagross, so uh, it does have the opportunity to change moves if it so pleases. However, it is going to get full parrot here, and that Wish is going to get Jirachi back up to full health. Skarmory comes in, and it is going to start setting up spikes. Granted, Starmie is still going to be able to come in for relatively free. Just because Jirachi has Thunder doesn't magically make it beat Starmie. But, you know, it certainly has an opportunity to make Starmie take some residuals. But at a certain point, you might be letting your Skarmory get a little too uh, damaged. 38% is a scary point to be at, especially when you roar the Metagross out into a Zapdos. And nothing really wants to swap in on the Zapdos, especially after the last play. However, Endil keeps him honest. He is going to click the Thunderbolt. It will whiff on the Claydol. However, uh, it remains to be seen if this Claydol really has a great way to threaten the Zapdos, or if it has a way to threaten this Starmie, for that matter. Psychic not doing much. Earthquake can hit it okay, but Starmie is regardless going to have an opportunity to, um, you know, throw off a rapid spin here. And if you do have self-destruct or anything, it would not be the craziest idea to click it there, but I would suppose that Tomahome does not. Uh, I wonder if he has, like, refresh or something like that on there. 
but you have an opportunity to get the Starmie out of the way. I mean, you do lose your, your T-Tar check, but that's still... At the end of the day, I'm not a better player than these people. I'm just speculating, but... You know, they've done a good job to keep this game from, you know, going anywhere it doesn't need to. So, finally, Endil is going to land a hidden power on the Claydol. And that's going to do 45%. Claydol now 42%. Can't really afford to stay in again. And Draji's going to be able to take that hidden power without too much of an issue. So now there is a risk of Jirachi taking a Thunderbolt and uh, getting paralyzed. However, we are going to see Endo BP straight into his Tyranitar, and Tomahome is going to miss the Thunder onto it, which is going to be huge. Now Tyranitar does have, a, have an opportunity to throw out a Fire Blast, which he's not going to want to do. And Jirachi is immediately going to get burned. Tide's starting to turn for Endo. You know, Wish is still going to be able to get Jirachi pretty far, but yeah, they're going to be cutting it real close. You're going to need to pull Para here. And Endil does not get full Para. It's going to let the T-Tar take out the Jirachi, and I have to imagine it's all just going to start snowballing here. You know, you, you get the opportunity to take out the, the Claydol, the Strummer is at 38%, and Metagross can just sort of boom, whatever. There's really not a bad target here. Thunder Wave could be important in the long run, but I have to imagine that Sweet Queen is going to rest that off sooner rather than later. Celebi is going to come in on the third Calm Mind. Throw the Hidden Power, and at this point he's just looking for a crit. The Sweet Coon won't be killing the Celebi anytime soon. And he does find the crit. That's going to take Sweet Coon down to 74%, and Sweet Coon gets full parried. And that's not good for Tomahome. And Suicune goes down there, and Tomahome doesn't really have a way to threaten this Celebi anymore. And he is going to be calling a GG. Tomahome's going to forfeit, and with that, Endil is going to take the game. So. Pretty uh, long, exciting night of games here. And with that, we're going to have tonight's winners. We're going to have the, uh, the new standings for the ADV tier going up. And it's important to note that if you're not familiar with SPL, these standings are not, you know, the, the standings of your team are more important than the standings of your tier. But obviously winning is going to help you more in that sense. So, oh my gosh, I'm so tired. I guess that's going to do it for tonight. Uh, you know, we look forward to next week. We for what these players are going to do, what they're going to bring, and uh, look forward to seeing all of you here then. So, uh, y'all have a nice night.